All right. My name is Sophia, and I am with VisitBlackHistory.com, which is a travel-based education and entertainment company. And I am here with uh, Jen Peck. One of the reasons why I really wanted to sit with you um, tonight, Jen, is because um, I know you are an educator. Um, you have a focus in social studies. You visit different black historic sites. And that is really, you know, the whole purpose of visit blackhistory.com is to really encourage, you know, people like yourself who are visiting these sites to share insight about the experiences that you are, you know, taking in at these spaces. So that's a brief synopsis as to why I'm with Jen Peck tonight. Welcome, Jen. Thank you so much, Sophia. I am so excited to talk to you today. Awesomeness. Awesome. This this conversation is, you know, a, a long time in the making because um, we met initially on the art scene. We were at the High Museum, um, one of their Friday night events where they, you know, bring in live music. And you shared with me that, you know, you were totally into visiting black history sites and we started following each other on social media and I will say that you have shown and proved that this is what you do I guess um we could get started by just you know having you tell me a little bit about you know your, yourself and why visiting black history sites um is a thing that you're into okay I would love to so a little bit about myself I have been teaching uh, since 1999, so a long time. And in that time, I, I've always loved history. I've always loved the arts. I minored in history at Fisk University in Nashville, Tennessee, proud um, graduate of a HBCU. And I just was always interested in marrying all my interests and building community. And I feel like even now, as I look back in retrospect, it's just something I've always been drawn to doing. So initially, while at Fisk, I belonged to the Race Relations Institute um, with Dr. Wimbush. He was the head of it at the time. I believe now he's in Maryland. He may be at Morgan. I'm not sure, but... Um, he was definitely very much involved in issues of social justice and civil rights. And in my undergraduate time, I was a member of that organization because those are, those are the things that spoke greatly to my heart. After I graduated, I, I was um, married very young and I was a single mom in New York City. And I was just trying to like teach my daughter about who she was, where she came from, and like have her navigate this world with the knowing that there was nothing that she couldn't do because we as African Americans in this country have, you know, really built this country, to be quite frank with you. And the limits around us are things that are constructed by society, not because we are limited in any way. And so I started a blog. It was called Plant a Seed Now. And what that blog did was give information about activities and arts and educational opportunities around New York City that had a focus on people of color. So I, I initially started down that path of like taking it outside of myself and my personal life to making it um accessible to people all over by having that on the internet. And I found that it was really popular amongst young mothers like myself looking for ways to connect their children. And so that's how I really started this journey as far as f going to historical sites, um, going to educational workshops, learning all this information, and then sharing it with community. Kind of that same uh, foundation that I got at Fisk when we would tutor outside of the school with each one, teach one, or when we would have our Race Relations Institute um, forum every year, and we had like Francis Cress Wellesley come, and like we had leaders and 
thought, I don't know how would you call them, um, thought leaders and uh, activists come and really show and tell with the, the work that they were doing around the country. So I, I wanted to kind of move in that vein and I would put information on a blog. Later on, as my daughter aged and she started to also engage in social justice, she's a storyteller herself, a filmmaker now as an adult. Uh, when I moved to Atlanta, I had recently joined a, a organization called Girl Trek, which is a international organization de dedicated to women of color. Um, and their whole mission is about overall wellness for black women. And I say that, and I need to be very specific about that because they are very specific in their mission. They don't exclude anyone, but they want anyone that wants to participate or wants to join know that the focus is black women. Um, two sisters, um, and when I say sisters, I don't mean blood related, two really good friends got together and they noticed that they were losing family members to um, preventable diseases like heart disease, high blood pressure, diabetes. And they came together and they said, you know, we should start a walking group. Well, they started a walking group that grew very rapidly and they realized that they had something here. This idea of black women taking ownership of their health, reclaiming their communities, and just dedicating time to self-care and self-love to improve their overall overall wellness. And I I actually joined that organization when I was still in grad school, either either I think 2016. But then when I moved to Atlanta, I became affiliated with many women that belong to that organization. And so Again, they were along the mission that I had actually, in retrospect, always been working toward, which is this idea of building community, um, learning, and like making the upliftment of people that look like, you know, look like me, you know. And, and, and I say that not to isolate anyone because I do believe that there's an adage, I'm not going to quote it correctly, but I, I do believe that when the when women win, everybody wins. I, I believe that. Like if I'm winning, everybody everybody in my household is winning. And so I feel like their mission was like by empowering black women, we're going to empower a whole community and generation generations of people. And I think that that is what they're doing. So that's really that's a long winded answer, but that's really how I got started and how my journey has continued. Yes, yes. And, you know, I hear in, in your response, you know, social justice, you know, comes up quite a bit. And what I'm understanding is that you are still involved in social justice causes at this time. So how does, you know, working with a girl track or visiting different historic sites, how does that further your efforts in, you know, social justice issues today? Oh, that's a wonderful question, Sophia. So first and foremost, I feel like it gives people an awareness. I I really do think many times, um, and I should speak from an I statement, I'll say from an I statement, it gives it has given me awareness. And so I feel like that when you when you understand your story and you share your story, you know that you're not alone in your story. So I know that it was empowering me and then I learned through others, through my shares that it has empowered them. When you have a knowing that you, your ancestors and what they have navigated and what they've accomplished and what they built and what they've in innovated, when you have that clarity and that knowing, I feel like it allows you access to go above and beyond. I feel like you have to look back in order to know where you're going. And so when I visit Black history sites and those kind of things, I feel like it just broadens an awareness, a knowledge base in myself and in others. And so for me, when you say, how does it further social justice? I think 
you know, right now is a prime example we can look at. And I'm just going to use, he just happens to be a Fiskite, just happens to be a Fiskite. I'm just going to use John Lewis, um, a fellow Fiskite, as an example. But the work of John Lewis um, really speaks to my mission that I had many years ago when I started planting a seed. It was all based on the quote that said, you know, a man that plants trees knowing that they might not never sit under the shade, but they, they, they have at least started to understand the meaning of life. They have planted the seed for blooms that they, know they may never see. I feel like John Lewis's work with SNCC, with Dr. King, I feel like it, it has brought forth these blossoms of these young people out in the streets. They've looked at the, the structure and the ways in which worked and what didn't work, the ways in which people were able to use grassroots organization to effectuate change. And I felt like because they saw what others endured, what they went through and still like faced adversity with such grace, class, persistence, resilience, they knew that they too could do it. And I think that that comes with every aspect and every avenue of life. It's like when you look back, there's not an area in, in, of study that we haven't accomplished great things. But that information is not always accessible to us. So if you're somewhere feeling like you're drowning and you have nothing to hold on to, you feel like this is it for me. And I feel like visiting Black history lets you know that you can and you will and you have, you're standing on the shoulders of giants and you need to know that information so you can navigate as such. So that's how I think that it impacts social justice. Wow, that's rich, Jen, for sure, for sure. And, and and that's exactly how I got into it because, you know, growing up in the Washington, D.C. area, we had access to the Smithsonian. And I was like about 20 years old when I really started questioning, you know, what, what is my path and how to, you know, take or what steps to take to make, you know, the right decisions. And that's when I really started looking at, you know, the people that had come before me, you know, whether I was watching um, their documentaries or, you know, visiting exhibits at different museums, um, I was able to, you know, take their experience and, like you said, have it inspire me, but, but also inform, you know, um, this work for them, um, Hey, it's po it's a possibility that it could could work for for me as well. So um, planting a seed, you know, I I love that ideology, and I love, you know, the purpose that it started off with for you as a, a young mother. You know, pulling together your resources that you were already using for yourself, but making them available um, for other you know parents to. Um, expose their youth to certain um, parts of history that isn't as mainstream. Um, so kudos to you. Definitely going to get more information before we conclude about how we can um, tap into, you know, the resources that you are pulling together. Um, let's go back to the early days of Plant a Seed. Um, what, what was some of the um, historic sites that you and your daughter really enjoyed in New York? Oh my gosh, I, you can name it. We've been everywhere. Well, like you mentioned museums and I, I thought about it when you said the mission of um, uh, visiting black history with education and entertainment, because we were like constantly, constantly looking for and accessing, opp accessing opportunities to learn and to grow and to be entertained. I was just telling someone the other day that um, my daughter has a sketch from Benny Andrews. I don't know if you're familiar with Benny Andrews, but he is a wonderful artist. And um, we used to frequent the Schomburg as did we frequent we i feel like many years we never missed the first saturday at the brooklyn's Mu brooklyn museum of arts there used to be there no longer is because my daughter is going to be 27 this month so many years ago you can imagine but um there used to be a black an african-american owned bookstore on 125th street called the human bookstore 
and we would go there and watch authors uh, read, read texts and um, ask questions and just anything around the city that you can imagine. We took trips to DC. We took trips to, um, to uh, Dr. King's home here in Atlanta. We took uh, trips to Booker T. Washington's home, to HBCUs. Just, I just was really dedicated to her learning as much as she could about everything. Like we lived in County Cullen Library. I spent a lot of time on a first name basis with the people at the Schomburg. So I would, what I would do is, because you say you'll tap into it a little bit later, but I can tell you that I would literally be looking up events throughout the city. And as a single mom, I would be looking for things also that were like cost friendly or I don't know, that's not the word I'm looking for, but like reasonably priced or even free. And I would be telling people, like I would go to work the next day and somebody would say to me, what did you do this weekend? And I would say, oh, we went to see this. Oh, we went to see this August Wilson play or we did this or we did that. And they would be like, how? How are you doing all this stuff? And I'm and actually, Sophia, I get that same question now. Uh, you know, I post all the time on social media and people will always be like, where are you? What are you doing? And I literally I'm I'm part when you say you want to tap in, it is that I'm actively looking for these things because I want to take in these things. So I'm actively searching. It's not because they're always like readily accessible. I think um, I shared with you um, recently that I had gone to the Sojourner Truth um, home in New York City. That was not something that was easily accessible to me. You know, I had to look up and find that information. But those are the kind of things that we did. We went to Seneca Village in Central Park. Right. Um, and we 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 really thought about the displacement of the community there. We went to Weeksville, like you name it, <laughs> you name it. We we probably have done it, you know, like you, you name it. We probably have done it. I mean, I just am really obsessed about learning as much as we can and being not only inspired, but like like you said, looking at the blueprint of information thinking about how it can propel us forward and also walking around. And to me, this is like one of the most important things. And um, some people may disagree, but for me, that confidence with humility, but that confidence in knowing that you are divinely made and divinely purposed and capable of whatever it is you want to do and your purpose to do. And I feel as though I've been many places and as a teacher, I've taught in environments where students have said to me things that have left me like on the floor in my in my mind, like my heart has sunk in where they are like, this is it. This is what we got. Or I wanted to do guerrilla gardening one time in a, in a school and I won't say the borough, but I would say I wanted to do guerrilla gardening because when I was coming out, I'd be like, oh, my gosh, this is not good. The kids are walking through this every day. We're going to plant some flowers. So I was in the class and I told them and I told them about this gentleman in Los Angeles that had made these beautiful gardens during this guerrilla, guerrilla gardening and we we're going to try it. So I taught them about it. And then one little girl, she was probably like eight or nine, and she said to me, mm, there ain't no flowers around here, Miss Peck. And I remember she said it to me with a realism, like like an older person, like a like like you tripping lady, like you're, you're all Mary Poppins over there and there ain't no flowers around here. That's how she gave it to me. And I gave it to her like this. They're, they're, they haven't been until now. We're going to put some here, though. And I remember her looking at me, and I remember her understanding that I was serious, and she knew it. And I remember her, the look that she gave me was like, I guess we can. And I'm like, yes, absolutely we can. And it's that, it's that idea. It's that vibe. It's that feeling. It's like there's nothing. I, 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 need, I need students. So that I that I meet and encounter and all people of all people, all humanity, but definitely people that have been historically told that there are limits on them, that there have been oppressive structures to make it appear 
like there are limits on them and that is not the case and so that's why like i'm super passionate about it and so when we met you at the high museum and you shared what visiting black history was doing you know my immediate thing was like oh well, where do I fit in? Cause like, it's something that like literally, I don't know if you can even hear it in my voice, but like, I'm super passionate about it. And, um, you know, and I believe, I believe in no, I believe that once students are equipped with that knowing, they move different, they move different. It's like, you know, not that they don't run into challenges or obstacles, but when they are equipped with that kind of knowing, they move different. Yes, yes, I totally agree. And, you you know, you you brought up uh, uh, Benny Andrews. Actually, let's, let's not talk about Benny, just Mr. Brother Andrews or Ancestor Andrews just yet. Let's talk about Schomburg because that's how he became the bibliophile. There was a teacher in Puerto Rico who looked at him as a young kid and said, your, your people don't have any history. Yeah. And, and he was so hurt by that. He said, shoot, I'm going to go prove this person wrong. And he proved him wrong so much so that, you know, he now has an, um, a library institution that's in his name. You know, it was a Carnegie library at one time, but, you know, he had done so much work to create an African-American, African diaspora studies um, f uh, material and, and, and collection that they, you know, eventually turned the, um, muse excuse me, the library into the Schomburg li Library. So, yes, I love how you are, you know, empower empowering youth. You know, Schomburg took a teacher who spoke to him in a negative sense and allowed that to empower him. But we definitely need those pos positive forces like yourself to, you know, speak life into the youth and use this history to give them the strength to, you know, envision a community um, other than the ones that they may, or the circumstances that they may be born into. So thank you. Thank you so much for that work. And, you know, speaking of community, you mentioned that, you know, you cross paths with um, Mr. Uh, Benny Andrews. Let's let's look at his um, bio. It's described as uh, born in 19, excuse me, born November 13th, 1930 in Plainview, Georgia. Um, he was part of a farming community three miles from Madison, Georgia. And, you know, that's the beautiful thing about, you know, having this dialogue because I, I love taking road trips and mm -hmm. this, this area is about probably about two hours from my house, if that, and I, I don't know of, um, Benny Andrews work, um, that much, uh, but I now have a, you know, an, another place to visit and, you know, see the evidence of what he may have grown up in and, um, see if there's, you know, an opportunity to learn more about his work. So thank you for sharing that. Yes, you most definitely should. Now, I'm, I'm going to tell you, like, I went to the Schomburg, and I'm glad you gave the history on, on Arturo, because let me tell you, I knew that history, but as you were talking, I had a question in my mind, because Here's the question that I had, and then I'll go back to Benny. The question that I had is that I knew about that teacher that had been disparaging, that motivated and put that fuel in him. But what I don't know and what, I, what I'd like to know is what, what and who had that instilled that knowing in him that that teacher was wrong, right? Was that an innate knowing or was there someone that had instilled that knowing that that teacher was wrong? And I say that because so many students that encounter the naysayers will stick with that narrative. Like they will stick with that narrative. And that's why people will say that adage, like pull yourself up by your bootstraps, look at Colin Powell, he came out the Bronx, or Sonia Sotomayor, or they'll name different people and they'll be like, oh, but they, but also they don't know their narratives and they don't know their story. Because for 
every student that was able to combat the challenges, there's someone that the naysayer said what they did, like that disparaging teacher, and they didn't move further. And so I would like to know more as you were talking about Schomburg and like what was the thing that 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 he knew already to know that that teacher was not was not on the right right track didn't know what they were talking about i need to look that up cuz that i don't know i knew that story but i don't know the back story to to something that may have pushed him beyond just the motivation to prove them wrong but to know that they were absolutely wrong as they said it um but to Benny Andrews, I went there, like, to the Schomburg to um, do a hands-on arts project, and I took my daughter and her best friend in second grade, a little boy named Shiloh, from, like, Washington Heights. My daughter, Jasmine, and Shiloh, we went to the Schomburg, and Benny Andrews was lovely, and he was promoting this book, to which I still have in my daughter's bookcase. It's a beautiful book. It's called The Hickory Chair. Chair. So he, not only is he a renowned artist, he is a illustrator. I don't know, he might be uh, an author too. I know he definitely is an illustrator because I know I saw a book, another book called like Draw What You See. But when I tell you that he has such a way with those children, like I was remember seeing my daughter and Shiloh just in awe and then he was kind. He was kind. You know that Maya Angelou poem, you'll never forget how people make you feel. He was so kind. He said, let me let me sketch them. And he sat with them and he sketched them. And like, to be honest, I don't think I knew the, the, the um, depth of his work. I knew he was an artist. I knew I was seeing him at the Schomburg. But then I looked, I, I later found out that he was just such a, such a beautiful, beautiful artist. But when I tell you, like, they literally went to him, like they would go, like they go to their own, uh, some male figure in their family that they knew that they were safe and cared for. Of course, I was present, but they knew that. And it was beautiful to see. He was very kind, very kind um, gentleman. That's what I have recall about him. And like you say that he, if you do take that trip to Georgia, you know, Call, call a sister. One eight hundred call. Absolutely, absolutely. And it's 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 unique that he would be from Georgia, and you you met him in New York. But now, yeah, yeah now you also call you know at Atlanta the Atlanta area home, and um, you know to go back to the Schomburg your Schomburg question, I would say, you know, I'm going to go refer to a book that we have in my home. Is um, Schomburg, The Man Who Built a Library by Carol Boston Weatherford. And it has beautiful illustration by a gentleman by the name of Eric Velasquez. Um, and again, it's um, Schomburg, The Man Who Built a Library. And one of the main questions that Arturo asked is, where is our historian to give us our side? So that's wonderful. And, you know, I'm I'm, I'm what you just gave me about Mr. Andrews, um, Ancestor Andrews, you know, it, it, it might have taken me quite some time to read that in a book. So it's, it's great to hear, you know, from your personal experience, the, um, the character of the man, Benny A Andrews. Like, what was his spirit? How did he work with children? That might not even be recorded, Jen, but because you took the time out to involve your, ch your, your daughter and her, um, her contemporaries in, you know, learning about this history, you are able to um, be a griot in a sense, well, not even in a sense, but you are able to be a griot to keep a part of Mr. Andrews' legacy alive. Now, and every time I think about a Benny Andrews, I'm going to, you know, first and foremost, think about how he um, was with children, you know, through the lens of your experience with him. So that's why this is important for us to be in these spaces, to have these experiences so we can pass the information and, you know, the experience along. You were going to say? 
I know. I just love how you articulated that. I love that. And I have to say, like, um, you know, again, they teach us in grad school and I don't, you know, I don't know if they do in your educational program, but they always say when you're dealing with students or in a conversation, you should start with the I statements, like um, I statements. So I, all I can say is that I, I really do believe in the validity and the weight of and the importance of visiting Black history and this idea of knowing the work and the love and the, the seeds that have been planted by our ancestors because they, are, they were planted so that we can push them forward. I love that mural in Atlanta. I just went to it, what, yesterday? That said, or Sunday, I went to it Sunday. It said, the seeds were planted so we can dream. That's what they were there for. And I'm like, literally, I went to that mural and I was like, wow. Like, I swear, I it, to me, I just felt so connected to it because I said, you know, if you look on social media, you see my handles are plant a seed, plant a seed now, planting seeds. My blog was plant a seed now back in 2006. I have a, a business a LLC that says plant a seed it, because it's all about this idea. And people always ask me, oh, is that gardening? I'm like, I don't know. It could be. It could be the gardening because it's a, but it's, it's a, a multitude of seeds. I feel like seeds are planted every single second of the day you are having these in, in exchanges that can blossom into great things you're getting things that you need and i feel like so when you say i'll i'll see um i have a teaching artist which we'll talk about later but you do know her sophia she was a um art director um uh at the high. Um, I don't know what Yema's official title is, was, but she did the, um, what was it called? The Fridays. Do you know freak? Do you know what the Friday? Um, it was simply called Fr Fridays at the high, if I'm not mistaken. Fridays at the high. Oh, I think it was high frequency Fridays, mm -hmm. high frequency Fridays at the high. And she curated that whole experience, Yemma, Yemma Thomas. But she's an art teacher. I mean, not an art teacher. Well, she's a, a, a teaching artist. She teaches dance. And we always talk about the seeds that she plants when she talks about the steps from uh, the footwork of the Congo related to the steps that students are doing today or children are doing today that they don't even know they don't know but they just innately do it because there are seeds that are planted that we are connected to our ancestors even though we don't know it and i say that to say that when i say plant a seed i'm talking about the things that happen in our day to day that cause these beautiful blossoms that we may not ever even see. The conversation that we're having right now. Um, the mother that got home tonight and read a story to her child and in the story, there was some, it was about um, Marian Anderson. And then later on, this child gets a career in music and they don't know quite why they chose it, what exactly was that trigger moment, but a seed was planted. And like, when you think about Benny Andrews, Benny Andrews told the story. I didn't know that he was right here from Georgia, but actually if I look at the artwork, I would be able to tell that he was somewhere in the South, right? Because his story shares that. Like his story shares the beauty and complexity of Black people and the resilience of Black people, the love and care and tending land, the love and care and sitting in an, a finely um, wood hickory chair, the detail and love that went into a hickory chair and the experience that happened in the hickory chair, you know, like his, his, the way he moved in, in his art and his storytelling through picture tells me the story of here. So I should have known that because it tells me the story of here. So that's what I mean about seeds being planted. And this idea of like our history is a rich history and one to be proud of. 
like nothing to like um you know hang our head low about um i there was a year that i had to teach uncle tom's cabin um and i remember i had a student in my class and he he just could not take it he just was like, I can't, I can't, you know, and he felt when I had a one to one to him, he said, I don't want to talk about slavery. I, it's over. It's done. And he was in, you know, he was an African American student, but he was feeling some type of shame. And I had to sit with him and talk to him and explain to him, there's no shame for you to feel. You know, that is not a history that we should hide from or run from. You know what I mean? It's a history that we should look back and find the strength and resilience and the ways in which we navigated through the unthinkable, you know, and and know that we are just, you know, some people don't like this term, but, you know, I believe it. So I think that we're just like magical in a lot of ways. That doesn't make us invincible. That doesn't mean that we can be treated any kind of way. But I do believe that we are magical beings. So, yeah. I feel. <laughs> oh, my goodness. It's so rich. It's so rich. I could talk to you about this all day, but, I, you know, you and I are definitely going to, you know, God willing, connect on this topic o over time. So I guess, you know, like one of my concluding questions um, before I get your information and how we can stay, uh, you know, in touch with you and see all the wonderful sites that you are visiting. My, my last one of my last questions is um, what, what's what are your top three? today it may change next you know next month but what are, what are the top three historic sites that you have visited and why wow Sophia you're gonna give me a minute for that the top three the top three <laughs> yes. hold on let me think about this uh-huh we gotta do it like the, the music shows when they interview with the music artists they're like who's your top five rappers dead or alive so yes Top three. Wow. Okay. So I'm going to go the first one. Okay. The first one, I'm going to say it was visiting where Carter, you know, let me, oh, I don't know. Let me think. Let me think. Oh no, this is hard. All right. So I'm going to go, now I'm going to go with my, my first thing. Okay. My first, Thing would be um, going to Tuskegee and I'm going to say not Tuskegee campus in particular or not even Booker T. Washington's home although that's my cousin we blood related Book Booker T. is, is, is family but it wasn't it, was, it wasn't going to Booker T.'s home but it was going to where George Washington Carver worked on the campus and I think the reason for me was that I felt in awe of the man. I felt humbled by the man. I felt like learning his love for education, his curiosity, his um, understanding of the natural world. I felt like if, if we could all just have just a little bit of whatever it was that, that, that navigated through him and pushed through him, we would all be soaring. And I just remember feeling like this man, this man was the epitome of what brilliance, it, you know, is and, 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 and what, it, what it is in action. And, um, and his dedication was to give it to other people. You know, he was like, come sit with me, let me teach you, you know? And like when I, as an educator and as a teacher, I like aspire to be that, to be that, to be a, a, a continual and constant student and then to give back to other people what I learn, you know, what I learn. That's it. That's it. Um, so that that would be like number one, I really feel because I just remember feeling like so in awe and like really just like just move beyond words really i don't i really don't have the words to articulate um the way i was feeling so that would be number one um let's see number two number two what would be number two um 
this one is not at, as on a like high note that left me high that left me liberated that left me soaring um um learning learning and being amongst george washington carver's papers his work but i went to uh the national lynching museum and and i know it has another title um brian brian stevenson um established um in alabama and i have to tell you that that left me a little bit different that left me feeling like i feel like dr king's frustration and sadness in his speech i've been to the mountaintop like that left me feeling like, where do we go from here? And I'm gonna explain why. Because not only were there countless um, remembrances to lives lost for nothing at all, for the melanin in their skin and families with no name and jars of soil labeled unknown, 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 but knowing that they belong to the same family which was like a lot to take in, right? But in addition to that, we went to one area in the, uh, in the museum and they were building wings. And I said to the man, you're building spaces? And he said to me, well, yeah, we have to put something up all the time. And I was like, it's 2020. You know, and like for me, like that, like for me, like for that, that left me, I don't know, Sophia, like that left me in a, I don't, and I'm a pretty like sunny idealistic person, as you know, that left me a certain way because here I was looking at like soil that had been taken up for trees to honor people that we don't even know their names right and then the man told me as i noticed that they were building wings that they are honoring people you know and i and i knew that right i know brianna taylor you know like i know that but to see it in the way that it's put on exhibit there was a lot which like which also speaks to the need for the work right the need for the absolute work right like the never ending unwavering work so that would be number 2 that would be number 2 and then gosh number 3 what would be number 3 um top 3 top 3 um to be honest i'm 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 going to say I'm gonna say this, but um, I don't know that it is really my uh, top three, but I'm gonna say that being in um, Tribeca in New York City um, this year and going to where, um, during COVID, and going to where Frederick Douglass um, came as an ab abolitionist to um you know run his paper and to help others um get free and come come north i remember just saying to myself wow i mean there and being in washington square park and knowing that we own land there like we were land owners in new york city because these are very lofty places right now where i don't see a lot of our ownership there. And I'm wondering, it made me think about Michelle Alexander, it made me think about the new Jim Crow, and it made me think about how we need to go back and look at what happened to reverse strides that were made. And I say that because, you know, Reconstruction was a very pivotal time in U.S. history, where a lot of changes were made to empower African Americans, a lot of HBCUs were created, and then suddenly there was a regression. Like, what happened? And so when I'm over in Tribeca and I know, I know that Black people were moving and shaking and owning property, and now our ownership is nil, Washington Square Park right there by NYU, or if you think about a Seneca village where we owned land in Central Park in the 80s, and now we're not there, like what happened? And how can we combat that? 
And to be honest, you know, reparations, what do reparations really look like? Because the displacement and the monies is like insurmountable. So I guess I said that that was a lot. That was more than three. But I'm going to say those three places. I'm going to say going to um, George Washington Carver's place at Tuskegee and looking at all of his work and all of his um, science, scientific study and knowing his desire to learn and the knowledge that he had and his willingness and love to share it, to empower other people, that would be number one. So I'm, I'm going to stick with that. Then the, the Lynching Museum, I'm going to go with that as the, or the, is the national, more, more, what is the official title? Because they, they call it the Lynching Museum, but it's also like um, a memorial. Correct. Uh, it's the National Memorial for Peace and Justice. In for Peace and Justice. Montgomery, right. Alabama. Mm -hmm. In Montgomery. So that's where I was, the National Memorial for Peace and Justice. And it's also been called the Lynching Museum. And the reason why is because they have, so much so many exhibits honoring those that were lynched or brutally murdered at the hands of you know racist people that wanted to create a world where we didn't exist or we existed under a structure of oppression so um that would be number two and then i guess um number three would be frederick Douglass's office in tribeca um, but I had a whole lot of other areas in Manhattan under that umbrella, but like those three things would be my top three. And for those reasons. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. And I'm glad you brought up the idea that we don't always leave these places feeling happy inside and victorious or uh, empowered. There are those instances where you feel like, well, I'll speak for myself where I walked walk away feeling a little, you know, confused, like, why, how in the world did this happen? And, you know, we haven't figured out a way to, you know, resolve it or, you know, give people, um, like you said, reparations for the pain that was experienced in a Tulsa, Oklahoma. You know, uh, why, you know, were a lot of the corporations that we started um why did they, you know, fall, fall, fall under after time, after a certain amount of time? Why did the sharecroppers not have an opportunity to um, get farmland after, you know, years of being enslaved and be able to utilize those skills? You know, you know, those good Booker T. Washington advocated skills um, working with agriculture. Why weren't, why weren't they, you know, allowed to get land even up until today? You know, there's still a lot of debate and um, legislation and legal disputes between black farmers and, you know, the, the, the major farming associations. So why is that, you know, still an ant? I mean, still a problem. So, yes, there are those times where you will visit a, a black historic site and you, you, you might have to stop past you know, a, a garden or a park just to sit and reflect and to allow those feelings to, you know, move through you in a healthy way and hopefully use that to, you know, keep you on your mission um, as, a, as a person to do social justice work in today's time. So with that being said, Jen, again, like I said, I could talk to you all day about this good stuff. You too. So, you know, and honestly, if I'm being honest, I'm running. I'm, I'm running. So I'm, I'm, I knew, I, I'm glad we were on time for our Zoom. I was like, I almost took you to kill me. But now I have, I'm supposed to meet someone at seven. So I'm running behind. But it's okay. I'm moving. I'm moving. I'm moving. I'm moving. But I could talk to you all day because, like I said, I love the mission. I love your dedication. I love your passion. And I'm like, I want to be down in any way, shape, a form as you know I always tell that to you and I just feel like there was divineness in our meeting you know I do so um we were we were there on the same mission at the high museum and when I look back like I said I'm I'm on my spiritual walk and when I look back I see the connectedness in all things and I know that there is connectedness in our meeting so Absolutely. So I've met her. And if you've listened to this uh, in its entirety and you 
feel the same way as I do in terms of like just want to, you know, l- learn from her some more. How can people um, tap in, Jen? How can people um, stay connected to the different sites that you are visiting and everything that you have going on? Oh, that's wonderful. I would say that right now I'm sharing everything on social media platforms, which are at Plant Seeds Now and at Plant Plant Seed Plant a Seed Now underscore Girl Trekker, because I visit many of these sites while on my Girl Trek. Um, but I have to be clear, you know, Sophia and I did this before with Visit Black History. I have to be clear that these are separate entities. Like I happen to be on my girl trek when I am learning about these things, but it's not, that is not something that is sponsored by girl trek. And I have to be clear on on that, but I will say that girl trek also offers a wonderful black history boot camp as well. And they, many it online pretty soon hopefully sooner rather than later pretty soon i hope to have uh a maybe not a podcast but a weekly share of information in a very um in a video format so hopefully that will happen pretty soon and as always i will be sharing sites visited with visit black history as well nice nice we appreciate that Yes, yes, yes. I know you are on your way to your seven o'clock, so I don't want to, you know, keep you um, tied up too much longer. But again, thank you for your time, Jen, and um, going to continue to support you. And I, I thank you for your support. And I'll be in touch with you, and we'll talk soon. Thank you so much, Sophia. Again, I think you're doing wonderful work. Um, I will always share anything that I feel like would be fruitful, beneficial, a good seed to plant. I will always be sharing good seeds. So um, I'm wishing you just love, light, positivity, and I just hope that, you know, all, everyone can feel the love that we feel when visiting Black History.